I think there's a clear and present danger and it's staring us right in the face. Quantum computers aren't just smaller, faster computers that can do more. They operate off completely different fundamental physics systems. We'll build quantum computers to solve chemistry and materials problems. People will invent new materials that everyone will use. Of course, with, with any new type of technology, uh, it can be used as a force for good, and it can also be used for a force for not so good. When we're building quantum computers, we're working off three underlying principles. The first is that of quantum, which is quantization. So energy is no longer continuous, it's actually discrete. So we've got two separate energy levels or discrete separate energy levels. The second concept is that of superposition. So this would mean that the quantum bit, also known as the qubit, can be a one or a zero or can be pretty much anything in between. So this would mean that if you have a coin, so if you have a head or a tail, it's binary, it's either a head or a tail. But if you're spinning that coin, then it's both a head and a tail at the same time. If you imagine spinning that coin, that's the point that's in superposition. And then when you put your hand down and you look at it, that's when you can tell which state it's ultimately in, if it's a head or a tail. Entanglement is the third one. With entanglement, if you had two coins that you were spinning, the result of one would impact and change the result of the other. So entanglement, superposition and quantum are basically the basics of the building blocks of, of quantum computing. Because it draws from so many different fields, there aren't even quantum computing departments in university. Meanwhile, if you go back to that simpler example of physics, you have physics uh, at high school level, you have physics at university, you have physics PhD programs, you can take someone through a whole journey. We're still defining that journey for quantum computing today. When people talk about computing the way that nature computes when they describe quantum computing, I actually think that that's very, very close to the truth. We might be able to shift the boundaries of what can and can't be done with machines. So it's not just uh, about being faster. I'm interested in quantum computing to build a general purpose quantum processor where you could solve a variety of problems on it in the same way that we use regular classical computers. What I think about is using it for quantum chemistry, which is in fact uh, Richard Feynman's original proposal for a quantum computer, where you map whatever the physics is of electrons interacting in a molecule via the atoms, and you map that into a quantum computer. And then since that's a, a classically hard problem because of quantum mechanics, then you use the quantum mechanics, the power of the quantum computer to solve the problem. My hope and dream is that if we build a quantum computer to do that, then we can actually start solving these practical quantum chemistry and quantum materials problems. Better materials, um, um, and, you know, let's say better batteries, uh, well, it could be a real game changer for the world economy and, and, and the like. I don't think we'll fully understand the impact that it can have until we've got the systems and we can really start playing with them, but we do know it's going to be revolutionising and, of course, incredibly lucrative for some. I wanted to build a business, I always have, but, you know, I, I had this hunger um, for, you know, something that was going to be more than that, something that was lasting, and something where, you know, you could look back at it and say, you know, well, we did something that really had an actual impact. That same realisation is what got me interested in the ethics of it. Because, you know, while I was talking, you know, to, you know, our co-founder Dave and some other folks, we were realizing that, yeah, it was worth financially backing this because the end potential was so big. But, you know, as someone, you know, who thinks about ethics and morality, I was like, well, the, the you know, corollary to that is you could have a really significant negative impact. The powers of technology really caught, I think, is in a moment for us to 
pause and cause us to take a step back to say, wait a minute, if we can do in a few minutes what it would take 10,000 years to do with our current technology, well, that really requires some careful consideration what that kind of power can mean. My generation was asleep at the wheel in the 90s. The pursuit of various different returns overcame our sensibility. If you think 100 years ago, 150 years ago, when mass media first made its appearance in the form of newspapers that millions of people would read, we put controls in place. When railways started to emerge, we put controls in place. In the mid-90s, and really the combination of the internet revolution and what's happened with mobile telephony, we gave up. There were no controls. Now, we get very excited uh, as societies about things like 2008 and 2009 and the so-called the, you know, the bankers that were at fault. But this is a far, far bigger issue that we're facing today because of being asleep at the wheel in the 90s and the early noughties. So if we think about what it can do for good, of course, each of those industries, you know, pharma, molecular simulation, creating new materials, that's wonderful. But of course, it could also be used to create new materials for purposes that aren't so wonderful. Um, we start to see and understand why governments, for example, are interested from even a material science perspective. And of course, the infamous one is, of course, Shaw's algorithm and the understanding that quantum computing could one day likely break um, encryption. And ultimately, you know, all technologies have things that they can, can be used for good and things that they can be used for bad. Um, what we have to understand as a community and, and address now is, is it worth the risk? Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. We do have a number of lessons that have been taught us or hopefully have been presented for us in artificial intelligence and the invasion of privacy uh, laws which are now significantly uh, causing restrictions in Europe uh, with respect to the management of per personal information and personal data. Face recognition issues, for instance, are, are uh, in this country a matter of significant uh, controversy and importance because of the implications of inequity and discrimination against people with differing uh, facial characteristics. Um, the, the, the whole area of medical science and who owns the knowledge that is discovered by the quantum technology, how will it be applied? Who will have access to it? There's got to be a democratization of access to the benefits. We cannot possibly allow the inequalities in our society to be replicated and, and, and frankly become more extreme. If quantum computing was simply forever sold to the highest bidder and all the work on it was just done by the highest bidder, you'd have a bunch of really, really rich hedge fund, hedge fund people um, and you wouldn't have cured cancer at all. You wouldn't have done anything else. The ethical point being that I do think that we should you know, think backwards a little bit in terms of not only what can make the most money, which is fine, uh, well, but what can make the most impact. What happens when we have machines that are capable of understanding nuance, humour, emotion. I think that a quantum computer at some point, because of the degrees of freedom that it allows in the way that we cope with information, because obviously language is all about information, what you're doing and what whoever's listening is doing at the moment is processing information. When that happens, it raises some interesting questions. We've, if we look back on history, this is something which has happened countless times with all these different kind of technological revolutions or, or really transformative technology. And, and if we don't address that and recognise it now, then 
you know, we see um, you know, people that created nuclear warheads, of course, having complete mental breakdowns for a reason, <laughs> um, because we, we've not, we're not necessarily thinking about those full ethical challenges from the beginning. We know that the, the genie is going to be unlocked, you know, with the amount of venture, the talent, where we're at on the, the technology pipeline. It's not a question of, is quantum computing going to happen? It's a question of when. We're just early enough now to be having these discussions and that's why you see the discourse on quantum computing ethics um, that's starting to take form today. We have an opportunity to to do it differently than we have advanced prior uh, technological advancements. We have tended to deal with the problems as they occur and thereby there, there, there may, be, may be harm ensuing and we have chosen a strategy to bring in a multidisciplinary group of people to discuss what are the implications for this kind of information powerhouse. First of all, there is a knowledge hurdle in the sense that quantum mechanics is kind of strange and it takes, um, you know, some time to understand it. Now, you know, this is the way classical computing was in the, I don't know, 50s or 60s. You know, these were, this is what PhDs did, right? And then nowadays, you know, my, my kids in high school or junior high were learning how to program, you know, at a pretty sophisticated level because things are able to be abstracted well enough. And I think that will happen with quantum computing. But what I think is kind of interesting is now with the internet and the like, you know, people can kind of learn this on their own. Since 2016, quantum computers have been available online because now I can tell a student, hey, a quantum computer is now available online. It's not an imaginary concept that you need to think about. You can go program one. It's not so much that these concepts are difficult to understand. It's just that you don't interact with them on a daily basis. So there has to be a way to teach them in an interactive way that, that really captures the imagination of the person who's working with it. Here we have to just make sure to cast a really wide, diverse net to start to help, you know, make quantum computing look like the world does, which is rich and diverse, and is not just, you know, a bunch of white folks in Silicon Valley. At this point, I would say, globally, we do need to be having the conversations. We need to be having the conversations with academia, with governments, with startups, with industries, with different sectors. With ethics, it's all about discussions and having discussions early. What are the implications of a quantum computing society. Shouldn't we today be anticipating those issues as opposed to being asleep at the wheel again?